Father. Hey, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians, to the book of Ephesians. So you remember two weeks ago, um, we were started going through our purpose statement here at GBC, uh, which reflects the, the purpose of the church that is found in Scripture. And the way we have worded it is that our purpose is to glorify God by building authentic Christian community and communicating Jesus Christ. And you'll see throughout the scripture that the role of the church is to exalt God, to edify the saints, to build them up, to be more like Christ, and to evangelize the lost, to share with them Christ and the hope that we have in him. And as we're teaching through it, we're doing it a little bit differently than we've done it before. We're teaching it in the way of prayers. How can I pray that God's purposes for GBC be accomplished? What can I pray for? How should I pray? And do you remember the last time we we looked at praying for God's glory from Psalm 115 verse 1, which says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. And we saw from this prayer that in praying for God's glory, there was a persistent conflict that we needed to heed, that we're not subtly seeking our own glory over God's glory. We saw that there was a powerful plea to make, uh, to thy name give glory. And so we're basing our prayers on God's worthiness and not our worthiness. And then we saw there was a persuasive reason to argue with God, that we argue for God's own faithfulness and covenant loyalty to glorify his name. Lord, you said you would do this. Now, because you are faithful, because your covenant loyalty is such, do what you said you would do so that you are glorified and this morning we want to look at the second of our purpose statements which is building authentic Christian community or as I've titled it praying for God's church how can we be praying for Greed and Bible Church that God's purposes would be accomplished in us amongst us through us the difficulty of doing topical sermons and especially one like this is What do you choose, right? I mean, what do you pick to pray for? You think about it. Every command that God gives concerning the church could fill your prayers for a lifetime, right? Even if you prayed all day, every day, they would just fill your prayers. You could never exhaust them. And once you've prayed for it, it's not like you pray for it one time. You'd continually pray for it, right? You you are continuing in prayer for these things. And so we have all of the commands of God in Scripture in regards to our attitudes and our actions and the kind of people we should be and how we should regard one another and how we should relate to God and to unbelievers. And and so we could be praying for that for for an eternity. But then there's also Paul's prayers for the church as recorded in Scripture. And what better way could we pray for GBC other than to use an apostle's prayers as a template? Paul, the apostle Paul, chosen and sent by Christ to be an apostle to the Gentiles to teach them the grace of God in Christ and the obedience of faith. So surely he would know, right, what to pray for the church. And so we could, we could study Paul's prayers and we could use them as a template for our own prayers. And if this is something that kind of sparks your interest, something you would like to do, which I would highly recommend, then I would commend to you a book by D.A. Carson He's written an excellent book where he does this. He outlines Paul's prayers and he shows then how you can be praying along the same lines that he did for the church. Um, The book's called A Call to Spiritual Reformation. I was looking it up the other day. He has a second edition of it. It's called Praying with Paul and you can get it on an e-book. So just a, a real resource and encouragement for your prayers. But besides the commands, besides Paul's prayers, we also then, of course, have our Lord's Prayer. Right, which we find in the accounts of Matthew and Luke, what the, the Lord Jesus himself taught his disciples to pray. But this morning, I wanted us to consider just three requests to pray for GBC. Um, one is based on a prayer of Paul's, while the other two are based on two commands that he gives, and it's all within the book of Ephesians. The elders have been thinking and and discussing about going through this book next year, and so it's been on my mind, hence we're looking at it, and and just some of the things kind of rose up as I was reading through it and thinking about it, and and so we're going to look at this, these 
three prayer requests that we can make as a church for GBC. And here's the first one. The first request to pray for GBC is that we would know God better. Right? That we would know God better. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. We're going to spend a bit of time just looking at this because this is really foundational to every other prayer that we're going to be looking at praying. But in verse 17 of chapter 1, Paul says... Um, that the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. That God would give you a spirit of wisdom or insight and of revelation or disclosure in the knowledge of him that is of God. When Dr. James Montgomery Boyce was asked what he thought was the greatest lack among evangelical Christians in America, he replied, quote, I think the greatest need for the evangelical church today is for professing Christians really to know God, end quote. That's a striking comment to make considering that knowing God is at the heart of the Christian faith, isn't it? Every Christian knows God personally. John 17.3, Jesus made it clear that eternal life was about knowing God. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John uses the phrase knowing God as a synonymous term for being saved. So in 1 John 4, 7, he writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you know God, then you are saved. If you are saved, then you know God. Personally, you know him. You have a relationship with him. Conversely, not knowing God is a synonymous term for not being saved. And so in Matthew 7.23, Jesus warns that on a day of judgment, those who falsely profess to be his disciples will be told to depart from him, and he will say to them, I never knew you. And that's not an omniscient way. Christ knows all things, being God. But he's speaking here of in a relational way. Personally, I didn't know you. You had not come to me. You were not trusting in me. And so we see this dividing line between what is a nominal Christian, a Christian only in name, and then a true Christian, is knowing God. That's the difference. Not knowing about God, but knowing God. Last week was my father's uh, memorial service and there was a man there who we asked to take at his glass and he had known my dad for quite some time both before and after he became a Christian and he mentioned uh, in referring to my father how he knew him when he was a nominal Christian my dad was raised up in the Anglican church and so he, he knew about God he knew about Christ he knew about religion but he spoke of dad as being a nominal Christian one in name only but then my dad came to know Christ. And I remember as a young boy seeing my dad being baptized. And then he spoke of the change in my dad, just the difference from being a nominal Christian to being one who loved and followed Christ. And the difference was that he now knew God. He knew God. And knowing God influenced and renewed and transformed his life. And so parents... This is always the concern of, of you when you're raising your children in the church, right? That you want your children to know the difference between knowing about God and then knowing God. I mean, in order to know God, you have to know about God, but then there's a difference between the two. An example of this is, look with me in John chapter 5. verse 39 Jesus is saying to the religious leaders look you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is these that testify about me and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life and so our kids can grow up knowing the scriptures knowing about Christ but then we need to encourage them to come to Christ to the one they read about, to the one we are explaining to them that he is a, a true and living person who offers forgiveness and salvation to all who would trust in him. 
And when we raised our own children, we would tell them, and we still tell them today, listen, Christianity is not about rules and regulations. It's about a relationship with God. It's about knowing God through Jesus Christ, knowing who God is and knowing what God is like, knowing what God loves, knowing what God hates. It's a relational knowing that transforms you more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. You read of the saints of old. You think of Job, you think of Isaiah. They knew God, they knew God personally, but then they got glimpses of God's glory and it just changed them even more. And that's what knowing God is like. And so what are we praying then when we're asking that where's a church might know God better? Well, for some, it might be coming to faith in Jesus Christ for the very first time. They know of God, and yet they need to come to actually know Christ personally. But in the context here of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is praying essentially that the church will know him more intimately. That they will grow in their understanding and knowing of God and their relationship with God. When you think of your spouse or perhaps your best friend, there has been a process of getting to know them, hasn't there? I mean, the more time you spend with them and the more time you spend with them and you see them in various circumstances and situations, you get to know them more and more. You get to know what buttons to push or what not to push. You get to know what they love and what they hate. You get to know their fears, their joys. You get to know so much about them the more time you spend with them. Likewise, that's with knowing God. There is a process of getting to know him more and more intimately. It begins with first coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And we enter into fellowship with God. But then it's about knowing him and growing to know him and enjoying him for the rest of this life and even on into eternity. Will we ever exhaust knowing our God? Psalm 145, 3 says, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Don't you want to know that? To be, it's almost like standing on the precipice of something and you just want to see how unsearchable that greatness is. Not that you could ever search it out, but you just want to get a sense of its awe and its wonder and its greatness. I've given this illustration before, but it, it suits here again that when we were living in the United States, we visited Yosemite Park. And if you haven't been there, and if you get the opportunity to go there, I do highly recommend going there. But it's just this majestic place with picturesque scenery, just imposing views of mountains and trees and forests. And while we were there and exploring and looking around, I got to talk to a couple who had been visiting the park uh, every holiday. I think they get Americans get like two weeks, I think, generally, of holiday per year. But they would spend their holidays visiting this park, and they'd visited it for 20 years, and they still had not seen every mountain and every valley. They were just exploring it. And they kept coming back, one, because the place was majestic, but also because it was just unsearchable. There was more majesty to see. So if that's true of God's creation, how much more of God, who created it all? How much of God is there to know and enjoy and experience? Look in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul prays that in verse 18 that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. You could not grasp the depth and the greatness of Christ's love for us. It surpasses even our own understanding. And then the psalmist, when speaking of God's omniscience, He writes, such knowledge is too wonderful me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. How can I comprehend that God knows everything at once without effort? He knows my thoughts. He knows my my desires, the, the hiddenmost secrets of my heart. He knows where I am every time. It's just knowledge I can't grasp. And yet to know that God knows everything about you is comforting, isn't it? Maybe if you're not in Christ, it's scary. 
well, listen, uh, even in times when we, we're, we're, we're in a trial or suffering or there's heartache and we can't express in words what to pray, listen, we know that God knows. And we can just say, Lord, you know. You know. And you know what I need. And so here we see the love of God and, and the omniscience of God, his knowledge of us and his love towards us. These are just two of his attributes to know that are unsearchable. But what about the rest of God's attributes? What about the rest of him, of his perfections? We'll spend eternity knowing and enjoying God. By the grace of God, we've been brought into fellowship with him. And he has received us into his home, as it were. And he has called us to be a part of his family, adopted through Christ. And so salvation is more, so much more than just the forgiveness of their sins. Listen, it is a right relationship with the living God. That's what salvation is. Knowing God is what we were created for. Knowing God is what we were saved for. Sin separated us from God. But God, through Christ, has reconciled us back to him so that we once again might know him. And knowing God is the wellspring out of which we live the Christian life, out of which we understand the Christian life for the glory of God. You can't comprehend God's commands without understanding who God is. It, it makes no sense. And you see this, this idea that, that knowing God is the wellspring out of which you live your Christian life, in which you understand the Christian life. We see this in Ephesians. And you can look in, in verse 1 of chapter 4 here. Paul basically has this outline of the book. And you read there, he says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So everything in Ephesians up to this point is all about our calling, our calling into fellowship with God, our being adopted as God's sons in love, our being made alive in Christ when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, of our being reconciled to God and being made a part of his family. That's our calling. And then what follows from chapter 4, verse 2 onwards, is the conduct that befits a child of God. Hey, you are a Christian now. You are a child of God now. You know the creator of heavens and the earth. And here is the conduct that befits a child of God. This is now how you live. And Paul understands that our conduct makes no sense if we don't know the God who called us or what he has called us to. And so right at the beginning of his letter, he prays in 1 17, 19, that God might give to us through the Holy Spirit insight and disclosure and our knowledge of God in order that we might know the hope of his calling, the riches of uh, the, sorry, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. This is how you're going to live out the Christian life. Because you know God and you know the hope of his calling, you know the inheritance that he has in you, and you also know the greatness of his power toward you to live out that life. And Paul then expands on all of this throughout the rest of his letter. But the implication here is that knowing God is not the static relationship, but one that we continue to grow in. And it's increasingly evident in the life that we live, especially in our attitudes and spiritual dispositions such as humility and gentleness and patience. I was found... Raising teenagers more difficult than raising young children. And, and I think in some ways there's a reflection of that in being a young believer and a mature believer. I'll tell you why. With young children, there were just rules and, and boundaries. Do not touch this. Do not go here. Do this, do this, obey mum and dad. And, and so there were rules and, and you, could, you could govern that. Right? And in some senses, new believers are like that. They, just, they have rules and, uh, within the Christian life. I do this, I do that. But then when they become teenagers, it's more about attitudes, isn't it? It's attitudes 
<laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> um, it's more about attitudes. Like, hey, um, consider others above yourself. Okay, well, you know, you can give them specific things to say and do, but, but you're wanting them to take that attitude and just apply it to every relationship in life. And so to gain that attitude of considering others above yourself is a lot harder to teach and to communicate than it is rules and regulations. And so that's where, as, as a parent, your example is so important to, to, to your children so they can see it in their relationship with you. And same with the Christian life. You know, we, we, can, we can make our religion, our relationship with God about certain rules and regulations, but it's, it's about relationship in which we know God and he impacts upon us certain attitudes and dispositions that we're to have. Humility, gentleness, patience, kindness. And you're to think those through and work those out in your relationships with people in the church. And so hopefully you can see then that theology proper, the study of the nature and the character of God, is the most practical endeavor anyone can ever engage in because knowing God is crucial. It's so important in living a life that glorifies God because you are wanting to reflect in your life all that you know and understand to be true about God. And so the less you know about God, the less you are able to glorify him in. That doesn't mean you're not going to glorify him. But it's about wanting to know him more and more because of who he is. And then wanting to glorify him more and more in your own lives. Lord, where are the areas in my life where I I can reflect you more and therefore glorify you more? Because I I just want the world to see that and praise and honor you. So listen, it's, it's not humble or it's not more godly to know God less. It's quite the opposite. Imagine saying to your spouse or your best friend, yep, yeah, that's it, that's the level of my knowing you. I don't really want to get to know you anymore. I'm, I'm happy with where I am. Let's just keep it status quo. I mean, that's not honoring to your friend. It's not honoring to your spouse. Likewise with God. And so Paul prays for the church to know God better. And it's a prayer that we should pray for one another. Why do we want to settle for less when there is so much of God to know? Not just in breadth, but in depth. And so that's Paul's first request, that the church might know God better. The second request that we can pray for ourselves at GBC uh, is to maintain unity. Is to maintain unity. So look with me in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 3 and 6. Paul says there, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Interesting that when Paul talks about us being called to salvation, straight away when he begins to speak about how this fleshes out in our daily lives, it's a call to unity. But notice that a unity is not based on um, anything that we've done. It's based on who Christ is. It's a unity that has been brought about by the Holy Spirit. Our unity then is evident in the metaphors that Paul uses in regards to describing a church. He speaks of the church as being a building. There are many stones being built upon one another, and yet we're a temple of the living God in whom God dwells by his Spirit. He speaks of us as being a body. The body has many parts, and yet it is one body, functioning and working for the good of the body. And so as a, as a church, it's important to understand that we are already spiritually one in Christ. We are already spiritually one in Christ. Our responsibility is to preserve that unity through 
not only what Paul commands, but also through prayer. We pray that we would maintain unity. Look with me in in, um, Ephesians chapter 2, where where Paul describes this unity in verses 18 to, to 22. And you see it here. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So through the Son of God, we have our access in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the Father. So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Here is the basis of our unity and now it's up to us to diligently by God's grace preserve it, maintain it. And so that would mean amongst other things, in praying for our unity, that we maintain it, it's praying that we would all submit to the word of God. That we would all submit to the word of God. So look at Ephesians 4, 11 and 13. He says he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And we read this morning how it's through the word of God that we were born again. And it's also through the word of God that we are transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ, that we know how we ought to be as God's children, how we ought to relate to one another, how we ought to treat one another. And so this means submitting to what God says in his word. I think this can be hard at times for Christians who, like us, I'm not saying it's us, but Christians like us who live in democratic countries, to grasp that the church is not a democracy, nor is the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom. And the kingdom has a king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he rules with perfect justice and perfect wisdom perfect righteousness, perfect love. Likewise, the church has a head. It is who? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of his church, the body of whom he fills. He has redeemed us. He has saved us. We didn't redeem ourselves. We didn't save ourselves. He did. And we've been called into fellowship with him. And so he is the authority over the church. It's not me. It's not you. It's Christ. And he has mediated his authority to us through his what? His word. His word. And so it's our responsibility as a church, whether it's, whether it's the, the, the congregation, but especially the elders, who are given a heavier weight of responsibility and therefore incur a greater judgment if they get it wrong. It's our responsibility to discern then what Christ says in his word and to then carry it out. Submitting to Christ by submitting to his word. I know this may sound harsh, but sometimes it just it isn't what we think. It's what Christ has said. It's not pursuing our will, our ideas for the church. It's pursuing what Christ has laid out in his word for his church whom he gave his life for. And so praying for unity means praying that we would all submit to the word of God. We recognize that it is Christ's authority that we're submitting to. Praying for unity also means that praying we would all grow in humility and gentleness and patience. Think about that. We come from all walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different ethnicities, however you might mention it, 
and we've been all brought together in Christ. And the first thing Paul talks about here in, in chapter 4, verse 2, is that we, with all humility and gentleness and patience, live in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. How much do we need those attitudes, those dispositions, to live together in harmony, right? The, the biggest threats to the church is fractured relationships within the church. And we looked at this when we went through the book of Philippians. We see that sometimes people can sin against one another. And so it's going to require humility and gentleness and patience. We see that some people will be offended by others, whether it's sin or not. And so we're going to need humility, gentleness, and patience. Some people's preferences may be set aside. Some people will act in pride or out of selfishness. And all of these things, when, when this happens, when we feel slighted, we feel sinned against, we feel an offense, it's easy then for us to express, as Paul says here in, in Verse 31 of chapter 4, bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. These things kind of rise up in us and we, we feel a sense of injustice because of what's happened. And so then what happens is there's this fracturing of relationships. And so, listen, if you sense this bitterness in your life towards someone or you're angry towards someone, or you, you, you slander people, you speak about them or ill of them behind their back, or you just speak openly, negatively, or condemningly about them. Listen, for whatever reason you're doing that, it's not justified. God knows well what it is to be sinned against, doesn't he? And he sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. We are saved by grace. And the Lord expects us to exercise that same grace and love in being reconciled to one another. Amen? Amen. The Lord knows that we will sin against one another. The Lord knows that offenses will be given and taken. He talks so often in his word about older saints, mature saints, and weaker saints, and how they judge one another or despise one another. And the Lord says, that's enough. None of that. Your responsibility is to love one another. I have chosen you. You are acceptable to me. You have no reason to not love one another and seek each other's spiritual well-being, even as I seek your own. Everything that Christ does for us is so that we might be more like Christ. And so we have to have that same redemptive attitude towards one another. Paul in, in Galatians, turn back with me a few chapters to Galatians, the book of Galatians in chapter 5. He says this in verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. I keep saying this as we're going through the book of Philippians. We are a people reconciled to God who ought to live reconciled lives to one another. And in that, people will see the powerful effect of God's saving grace, of salvation. I mean, look, the world is crying out for unity, isn't it? The world is crying out for unity. I don't know if that's what globalization is all about, but it, it, somehow it's wanting to bring everything together. No borders, let's just, let's just get along. Unfortunately, we all seem to be wanting, that the world seems to be wanting to get along on kind of a humanistic philosophy. And it seems to be an embracement of all sorts of nonsensical, immoral ideas regarding sexuality and, and marriage and relationships. And yet here we have 
the church with the precious gospel that reconciles not only sinners to God, but sinners to one another. And we should be displaying this to the world. You want unity? Here is how it is achieved. Look at GBC. Look at how we love one another. Look at how our unity objectively is not in my ideals or what I think or what you think or what you desire or what I desire, but in who Christ is and what he desires and what he has done for us. And if the world rejects that, the world rejects that. But it's for us to show that. Amen? And so here, Galatians, Paul talks about um, loving one another and that brings us to the, our third and last request in prayer, we pray that we would know God better, more intimately, more deeply. We pray that we would maintain unity within the church because we are a family. We are one in Christ. And the third request that we can pray for at GBC is to love one another. You knew that was coming, right? It's to love one another. Look again in, in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 of Ephesians. He says, therefore, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Again, how we love one another is linked to our understanding of who God is and how he has loved us in our relationship to him. Be imitators of God as his children who gave himself up for us, Jesus Christ, as an offering for our sin. And so the more we, we grasp this about God, the more we, we grasp the breadth and length and height and depth of Christ's love for us, the more graciously we will love one another. I mean, thinking about what Michael said today at, at, at communion about would, would I die for, for wretched sinners? You think we should, right? Because we were wretched sinners. And Christ died for us. And so when we think of that, as we, as we take communion and, and we think about the death of Christ for us and who we were, dead in our transgressions and sins, engaged, in, engaged with Satan and hostilities against God, it's evident by the way that we lived our life, no matter how we lived it. It was all in rebellion against God. And yet God loved us and gave Christ to die on the cross for us and saved us. And so the more we grasp God's love for us, the more we will be gracious and redemptive in our love for one another. Paul alludes to this, I think, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. I find this interesting. He says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Let me ask you a question. When were you taught by God to love and to love one another? Yeah. Wasn't it when you understood the gospel of God's love for you and that the same love that God had for you expressed in the death of Christ, Christ was also expressed towards your fellow believers? Did he love you more? <laughs> Did he love them less? He loved you the same. And so it's there at the cross that we, we are taught by God to love and to love one another. And he says, for indeed, he says, you do practice it toward all brethren, which is right, because we're all loved by God. He says, but we urge your brethren to excel still more. You're doing a great job in loving one another, but listen, excel still more. You cannot outdo loving God or loving his children. In fact, you look in, with me in, in First John. We've been going through this as a, in the men's Bible study. 
And he says there in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. But that first verse there, whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Uh, if I remember the Greek, it's um, whoever, whoever loves the one who begets loves the one begotten by him. God is the one who begets. God is the one who causes us to be born again. And therefore we would love those whom God saves. There's also something interesting too when we read Ephesians 5 and 1 which, which the world fails to grasp and see although they actually practice it in a weird kind of way but they don't understand what they're doing. In Ephesians 5 and 1 there's this understanding that that love has moral boundaries. Love has moral boundaries. And so here, when you read all of Ephesians and when you read, in fact, all of God's commands, they are all expressions of love. Expressions of love towards one another, expressions of love in the context of the church, expressions of love towards one another in the context of the family, husbands and wives, parents and children. There's a context of love in the workplace, workers and employers. And so all these commands that, that Paul is giving here are all expressions of love. And it comes off the back of the fact that he says, listen, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is walking in love. And so love has moral boundaries. The fact that God loved us and sent his son to die on the cross for our sins shows you that sin is wrong. There's a right and wrong. And so when it comes to your love for the brethren, how do you know you're loving them? How do you know you're loving them as you ought? How do, they, how do you know that you're loving them with the right attitudes? How do you know that you're loving one another with the right actions? How do you know that you're loving one another with the right words? If they fall in line with God's word, you are loving them like Christ. If you're not, then you need to repent and go back and say, Lord, how do I love my brother in this instance? And what is it about you, Lord, that will enable me to love my brethren as you love them? And so again, it comes back to our knowing of God. I'll leave you with a quote from J.O. Packer from a book he wrote, Knowing God, which again, I, every time I mention it, I highly recommend it, and I do. He says this, Knowing God is a relationship calculated to thrill a man's heart. Do you feel that? Knowing God is a relationship that is calculated to thrill a man's heart. What happens is that the Almighty Creator, the Lord of hosts, the great God before whom the nations are as a drop in a bucket, comes to him and begins to talk to him through the words and truths of Holy Scripture. Perhaps he's been acquainted with the Bible and Christian truth for many years and it has meant nothing to him, but one day he wakes up to the fact that God is actually speaking to him. Him through the biblical message. And as he listens to what God is saying, he finds himself brought very low. Humility. For God talks to him about his sin and guilt and weakness and blindness and folly and compels him to judge himself hopeless and helpless and to cry out for forgiveness. But this is not all. He comes to realize as he listens that God is actually opening his heart to him, making friends with him and enlisting him as a colleague, uh, as a covenant partner. It is a staggering thing, but it is true. The relationship in which sinful men 
Sinful human beings know God as one in which God, so to speak, takes them on to his staff to be henceforth his fellow workers and personal friends. And I would add to that, children. The action of God in taking Joseph from prison to become Pharaoh's prime minister is a picture of what he does to every Christian. From being Satan's prisoner, he finds himself transferred to a position of trust in the service of God. At once, life is transformed. Whether being a servant is a matter of shame or for pride, depending on whose servant one is. Many have said what pride they felt in rendering personal service to Sir Winston Churchill during the Second World War. How much more should it be a matter of pride and glorying to know and serve the Lord of heaven and earth? End quote. This is our Father. This is our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he has invited us into fellowship with him and with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are a family who know God and live that out in unity and in love to the praise and glory of God. So let's pray that we will know God better, that we will maintain that unity, and that we will love one another. Father in heaven, we... We thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the salvation that you have granted us in him. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the, the multitude of, of spiritual blessings that have been poured out to us in Christ. We thank you for the eternal life that is in Christ. Indeed, he is eternal life. Father, mostly we're thankful that we know you, that we can say, I know the living God. Lord, that it may thrill our hearts to know you. That, Lord, we would just desire to know you more and more. And that such knowledge, Father, would transform us to be more like Christ, to be more like you. And so, Father, you have blessed us immensely and we pray for your glory and for your name's sake because of your loving kindness and truth that Lord you would grant us to know you more deeply to be able to maintain our unity in Christ and to really love one another we pray in Jesus name